Hello, I'm Jennifer Keller, Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library. Today, I am honored to introduce Dr. Marjorie Feld, a professor at Babson College and author of Lillian Wald, a biography. She will be telling us all about this amazing woman who happened to live in Westport for a time. This presentation is part of this year's Westport Reads series. Hello, Dr. Feld. Hello. Thank you for having me. Dr. Feld's expertise includes U.S. social, labor, and women's gender history, along with the history of global human rights movements. She has won awards for her writing and teaching and was the faculty director for Babson's Center for Women's Leadership. Thank you, Dr. Feld, for your time. And I look forward to, to hearing more about Lillian. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just gonna bring up my presentation. Um, so first and foremost, I wanna thank you for inviting me and for um, adapting to this new reality. I'm here to talk to you about Lillian Wald, someone who dedicated her life to public health. So I know she'd be pleased that we're all sheltering in place and keeping public health in mind. I've traveled with Lillian Wald for a very, very long time. Um, I first began to research her as a senior in college in 1993. I feel lucky to have worked that summer at Henry Street, which is the institution she founded a century earlier. This is where I first really encountered that strong sense of Wald's presence, her living legacy. So I'm gonna to start today by talking about her hometown of Rochester, New York, and then her arrival in New York City I'll discuss how her time and place are key to understanding all of the vast campaigns she joined for public health, immigrant and women's rights, including women's suffrage, civil rights, and for peace and anti-militarism. And I'll end by talking a little bit about Wald in Westport, the home of this talk. So in the book, I talk a lot about Wald's universalism, her faith in a world in which everyone would belong to a universal family, and categories of nation, religion, race, and class would lose their power to divide. Wald's vision of universal belonging meant insisting on the fact that all individuals are connected and that all individuals are responsible for each other's welfare. So I start here with a seemingly simple question. How did this Jewish woman, the daughter of German immigrants, born in Cincinnati in 1867, right after the Civil War, and raised in upstate New York, come to embrace all of these ideas? So let's start in Rochester, New York. This is where the core, the spirit of her universalism lay. Now, Rochester has a fascinating history. Its spirit of liberalism, openness, uh, and experimentation can be traced, according to some, to the completion of the Erie Canal, to the traffic and commerce and ideas that the canal brought, and to the Second Great Awakening in the early 19th century, which brought liberal reform campaigns for charity, abolitionism, women's rights, and temperance, with women as central figures in each campaign. In Europe, Wald's family members were rabbis and merchants. They lived through the debates on Jewish emancipation that occurred in the 1830s and 40s in Germany. Now in these debates, German Jews emphasized their universalism, their similarity to the Protestant mainstream. They accented their assimilation and they really tried to speed their civic integration, mostly while retaining their ties to the Jewish subculture. So these were the ideas and experiences that, Wald carried, that, that were carried to the United States by immigrants like Wald's parents and her grandparents. So as you might imagine, Rochester with its very liberal zeitgeist was a good fit for these immigrant Jews who sought to integrate themselves into the American Protestant mainstream. Many flourished there. Rochester's temple breathed Kodesh, which means covenant of the holy, uh, was emblematic of that bit. Sorry, I'm trying to move a slide, there we go. Um, several members of the Wald family belonged to Temple Breit Kodesh, which began the decades of the 1870s with an unprecedented invitation for a Unitarian minister to speak from its pulpit. Soon after, it became the first synagogue in the U.S. to permanently adopt English instead of Hebrew as its language of ritual. During Wald's youth, the synagogue leader was Rabbi Max Landsberg, a radical assimilationist and one of a few rabbis in that era to officiate at marriages between Jews and non-Jews. So you see here this radical assimilationist spirit. The Wald family's early affiliation with Brit Kodesh fell away after her early years and she had no Jewish education. Her family endorsed a vision of complete assimilation. Like most Brit Kodesh families, the Walds were well integrated into Rochester's civic life and Wald herself which educate, was educated at an elite French boarding school for girls. 
Her faith in assimilation and integration then was really grounded in her family's successful assimilation and integration. Another lesson that's important for my talk today and that was important for Wald in her lifetime were the lessons in gender roles. Her father sold optical goods in the, good, in the town that brought us um, Bausch and Loam, and her uncles were capitalists in the city's clothing manufacturing industry. Her uncles were proving their Americanness in the competitive world of industrial capitalism. Her aunts were the softer side of capitalism, doing charity work, as was her mother. Now, Wald was really groomed for a society life. Her older sister, Julia, married into one of the town's prominent Catholic families. And again, you'll note that energy for assimilation. But it became clear that Wald was set for another path. She applied to Vassar at 16, but she was refused because of her youth. And then when Julia had her first child, Wald met a nurse. And Wald made the decision to leave what she knew of society life behind and pursue a career in nursing. And so at the age of 22, she wrote to the head of the New York Hospital Training School for Nurses, my life hitherto has been, I presume, a type of modern American young womanhood, days devoted to society, study, and housekeeping duties, such as practical mothers consider essential to a daughter's education. This does not satisfy me now. I feel the need of this definite work. And so she moved to a new place, to nursing school, to West 15th and 5th Ave. She was one of very few Jewish nurses in a field that was gradually professionalizing. And so once again, her upbringing, that sort of assimilationist spirit served her well. And this was also her first immersion in women's networks. Following her graduation from nursing school in 1891, Wald said that, quote, her natural love of children led her to the juvenile asylum on 176th Street. So here you have a photo of her at, upon her graduation. After one year there, she became increasingly critical of institutional care she decided to continue her education and maybe become a physician herself by entering the Women's Medical College in Lower Manhattan. The impact of these years on Wald's life was significant. She was surrounded by women who had made choices other than those of her mother, aunts, and sister, and Wald no doubt felt nurtured in her professional and personal development. Mary Brewster, Lavinia Dock, and other nursing colleagues, along with Jane Addams, Florence Kelly, and other settlement house experts and reformers she would meet later, Wald described herself as completely fulfilled by these friendships. And as a lesbian, she was also sustained by her intimate physical relationships with women throughout her life. This community helped to further expand her knowledge of the possibilities for women. Importantly, though, she continued to rely on her hometown lessons and gender roles and present women's public and professional possibilities as stemming from women's sort of natural roles as caretakers. This later played a role in her support for suffrage for women. While Wald was ensconced in a women's world with new role models and new possibilities before her, an older set of connections changed the course of her life. Her German Jewish background played an integral role in her first exposure to the lives of what were then called the downtown Jewish immigrants, the Eastern Europeans who lived on the Lower East Side. A Jewish philanthropy worker sought the services of a Jewish nurse to give home nursing classes uh, to Jewish immigrants. And after teaching one class, Wald was taken by a child to a sick woman in a tenement. And there was her first exposure to the lives of the industrial poor. Wald's public narrative of this first encounter comprises an often quoted section of her first book, The House on Henry Street. She wrote, to my inexperience, it seems certain that conditions such as these were allowed because people did not know. And for me, there was a challenge to know and to tell. My naive conviction remained that if people knew things and things meant everything implied in the condition of the family, such horrors would cease to exist. And I rejoiced that I had had a training in the care of the sick that in itself would give me an organic relationship to the neighborhood in which this awakening had come. Deserted were the laboratory and the academic work of college. I never returned to them. My mind was intent on my own responsibility. Though she was again relying on a traditional idea of women as maternal, as naturally drawn to help families, she was also really expanding the possibilities for women's public roles. All the maladjustments of our social and economic relations seemed epitomized in this brief journey, she wrote. And so Wald issued her first critique of these problems and carved out a space for herself in fixing them. So after this experience, which she always called her baptism of fire, she dedicated her life to the poor. She and her colleague, Mary Brewster, took up residence at the college settlement on Rivington Street. And so Wald and Brewster began their famed adventure by offering health care to the poor on a sliding fee scale. These were the visiting nurses. You can see their first um, 
living together in 1895. So there's a great story about her practical nature and her move to Henry Street, a move that the famous German Jewish financier, Jacob Schiff, funded so that she and her growing group of nurses could have their own space. As soon as they moved in, right, they were settling in with the poor in a settlement house in 1893, Wald asked that the mahogany doors be chopped down in the name of practicality. She had them made into huge tables around which residents and visitors could gather to educate each other as to what was needed to affect change. Meetings at those tables were responsible for the genesis of countless proposals for government and private social programs. They were a space to be held in common. Wald was a bridge across many networks, radicals, progressives, elites and the poor, women reformers and millionaire philanthropists, Jews and non-Jews. Her settlement and its funding had by then expanded to offer not only nursing on a sliding fee scale, but Americanization classes, theater work, vocational training, summer camps, and lots of other services. Throughout, she worked for the rights of those downtown in an era of tremendous nativism and xenophobia, and her neighbors voted with their feet, utilizing her services in droves. By 1913, which is when this New York Times article is from, Wald had sat on the State Immigration Commission, come up with ideas for a National Children's Bureau, she had helped negotiate the terms of the so-called Protocol of Peace for the 1909 garment workers strike in New York. She had raised funds for and built a social hall and an art center. She had held one of the founding meetings of the NAACP. That is to say, she was very much in the public eye. And so on the 20th anniversary of the settlement in 1913, the New York Times featured her. And in this interview, she defended the immigrants with whom she worked on a daily basis, calling them, quote, as you can see, good metal in our, in our melting pot. She argued for the humanity of the immigrants. We must know immigrants as folks, not as statistics, she said. She labeled the average American arrogant in his attitudes toward immigration. How can we forget that in today's raw immigrant is really hidden tomorrow's citizen, enfranchised and powerful? The East Side will never contaminate or harm society, she asserted. Instead, it was society's arrogance and exploitative nature that was harming the East Side. Her optimism, that strong faith in the idea that everyone could join the American family, emerged out of her hometown lessons and her progressive ideas. And indeed, her work for women's suffrage, which your Westport exhibit highlights, was in this same vein. In my biography, I mainly focus on the New York State Women's Suffrage Amendment, which failed in 1915, but ultimately passed two years later. Predictably, Wald's most visible work for women's suffrage was for her immigrant neighbors. She challenged local xenophobes who blamed immigrant voters for not supporting women's suffrage in 1915. In her book, she asserted in a very genteel way that I admire, quote, the conviction that the extension of democracy should include women has found free expression in our part of the city. And here, of course, our part of the city is a code for among the immigrants who support women's suffrage. She, like many early feminists, emphasized women's essential difference from men, women's naturally uh, moral and caring natures, and how women would therefore improve the corrupt landscape of American and world politics. Building on these many lessons, Wald began to talk about how her Henry Street community was giving her a new internationalist understanding of the world. She talked about internationalism as her institution's philosophy. In keeping with that idea, Wald brought back a symbol for the settlement, from a 1910 trip to Asia. This symbol reads Universal Brotherhood in Chinese, and it still greets you if you ever go to 265 Henry Street. Wald incorporated that role into the mission of her institution with nursing at its center. She continued to bring world figures to Henry Street's table for discussion of important issues. Her institution, in fact, stood as an international model for similar programs in nursing and social work. By 1926, nurses trained at Henry Street worked in 48 countries in Europe, Asia, and Africa. And she continued to argue, argue for universal understanding across boundaries of nation, race, class from her home at Henry Street. So this is Wald at the height of her career um, with her feet in New York, but with her influences slowly reaching to city, state, national, and global campaigns. She and her nurses were at home all over the world. Toward the end of World War I, when her mother, Minnie Wald, moved into Henry Street Settlement, Wald searched out a place in the country as a refuge from the hot city summers. She rented a country home in Connecticut for her mother on a small pond near the Saugatuck River. After her mother's death in 1923, Wald continued to summer and rest at the pond she then purchased, her house on the pond on Compo Road. In 
Westport, Connecticut attracted a number of Jewish and non-Jewish reformers and an artist colony. After decades of city living, Wald embraced country life and took great pleasure in sharing it with visitors. Jane Addams, the Schiff family, Eleanor Roosevelt, all came to visit and sampled her homegrown fruit and vegetables. She often took canoes out on her pond, the same pond in which British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald's canoe capsized in 1929. I put this here. Um, this is actually the only time Wald was ever on the cover of the New York Times when the British Prime Minister's canoe capsized on her pond. Uh, she had first met MacDonald in 1897 and both had been dedicated anti-militarists who had opposed World War I. When his canoe capsized, the Times read, a detective, without bothering to remove his shoes, walked in and freed the canoe. Above all, Wald adored watching local animals, including her dog, Ramsey, given to her by the prime minister, as well as turtles, ducks, swans, and geese. And she wrote of their movements and migrations in her letters. Writing from her house on the pond, seen here in this Christmas card, this holiday card, Wald reassured her friends that she remained in touch with world events. Despite occasional lapses on the part of mankind, I haven't lost my optimism and I am as happy as happy can be at the goodwill and progress that are discernible in greater measure than before, she wrote. I am very much for President Roosevelt and see many things developing that I feared we would live a long time to see throughout the country. For Eleanor Roosevelt, Wald reserved her highest compliment. She wrote, Mrs. R acts truly as if she had, brought up, had been brought up in the settlement. So Wald retired from Henry Street in 1933, and she lived out her final days in her Westport home. This is a slide of uh, Wald in Westport. After a lifetime of service, she continued to advise leaders on world matters and remind them of the plight of the poor. She continued to believe that universalism could serve her neighborhood on the Lower East Side, that her deep sense of mutual responsibility among citizens could be applied even to the global level. Outside of New York, in the countryside of what was then very rural Connecticut, she continued this work. Walt concluded her second book, Windows on Henry Street, with this story. We on Henry Street have become internationalists because we have found that the problems of one set of people are the problems of all, and that the vision which long since proclaimed the interdependence and the kinship of mankind was farsighted and is true. Such experience points to the inevitable, that people rise and fall together, that no one group or nation dare be an economic or social law unto itself. That has been the lesson we have learned in the years at Henry Street. The significance of connectedness among people and not their divisions, this was Wald's most important lesson. When she died in 1940, thousands paid tribute to her lifetime of activism, including mayors, governors, and President, um, and his wife, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt and his wife. Wald's ashes are buried in Mount Hope Cemetery, which is in Rochester. She returned to the hometown, her hometown, in many ways the birthplace of her vision. The cemetery itself reflects the diversity of a rapidly industrializing city at the turn of the 20th century. Um, her ashes are buried next to her family. Around them, there are gravestones marked with Hebrew lettering. Across the small path from the family plot are the very tall mausoleums of the families of Bausch and Loam, the pioneers of the optical goods industry that brought Wald's father to the city in the first place. Just over the hill from her grave are uh, the graves of two of the most important leaders in 19th century struggles for equality, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. On Wald's gravestone is the symbol she adopted for Henry Street after her first trip to Asia in 1910. The characters, as I said, read Universal Brotherhood. As she worked for universal understanding in her life, she hoped to symbolize it to future generations after her death. So we need to look at all of the places where we can find Wald's legacy, at the Visiting Nurse Service of New York and at Henry Street Settlement uh, on the Lower East Side. These two institutions uh, split shortly after she died. Here we can think about her legacy of inclusion and social activism, about universalism and its relevance to the 21st century. Her universalism let her institutions be flexible and adapt to changing times. And the longevity of these institutions speak to their ability to navigate modern challenges. In these troubling times of want and need for so many, I think it's really important to remember Lillian Wald's universalist efforts to convince all of us that we are in fact connected across space and time and that we rise and fall together. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was fascinating and 
so interesting that we had such a famous person fall into <laughs> one of our ponds. <laughs> I know, that's really one of my favorite wild stories of all time. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and now we'll all have to go find the pond, socially distancing, of course. Of course, but from and the car, it would be okay. Exactly. So yeah. thank you so much. And on behalf, on behalf of the Westport Library and the Westport Reads Committee, Dr. Feld, we really appreciate your time. And now we can all learn a little bit more about Lillian on our own. And so for you at home, for more videos and information about the Westport Library and other services, remember to visit us at westportlibrary.org. Thank you so much, Dr. Feld. Thank you, and stay safe, everybody.